this is what economic breakdown looks like and the real outcomes of Pacific Power Plays coming up on today's show. Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 3rd of June 2022. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party re researcher Richard Barden. Welcome, Richard. Thanks, Elisa. And on today's show, we're going to be talking about, you, you might be concerned about the cost of living. We're going to talk about the threat of living altogether, whether that is a live option for long. And secondly, um, we'll talk about how the media's gloating over the failure of China's plans for the Pacific is a complete crock. Uh, now, if you do like the show, make sure you hit the like button, share it as widely as you can, and you can subscribe to be alerted of further and um, additional and upcoming shows. Uh, now, before we get into the first topic today, last week we did spend quite a bit of time, Robbie and Craig, talking about our campaign post-election for a postal bank. We have to make this a reality and it's going to take a lot of organising, logistics in depth, on the ground activity and it will come down to you, the viewer, all of our good supporters out there that have helped us on many a campaign over the last three years to get things happening. Um, and I wanted to put a um, call out this week to a important article that was put together by journalist, independent journalist Dale Webster and you can go to her website The Regional to see this article and real a lot of other really crucial background uh, information for this campaign. Um, but this particular article that she's put out uh, has a lot of lists of towns across Australia uh, that are really important for people to take a look at because we want to really focus in on a number of these towns in the lists that she's put together uh, which do not have adequate banking services and begin to really build campaigns in particular in those local towns to put pressure on the local authorities, councils etc that can then feed the pressure up to state and federal levels that we need a postal bank to rectify this situation. So the first list, and we'll try to put this up on a screen if we can manage it because there's a lot of names here. This is a list of 575 towns that had one or more major banks that now have none. 575 of them. I mean, that is shocking. Um, obviously, some of them will have a post office, but for instance, if you bank with ANZ, bad luck because ANZ didn't sign up to the bank at post deal that Christine Holgate made happen. Um, there's another list she puts in there which is 44 towns that have lost their last or only big four bank in 2021. So that's a subset of the larger list. And there's another very long list which we also published in our Australian Alert Service um, because it's worth listing all these names of all these towns so you can see if your town's on there, of the most vulnerable towns to a total loss of banking services. So they're the ones that will soon be added to that big list of 575 if we don't you know, make some changes happen. So get engaged in that campaign. You can go to our web page uh, on the Postal Bank campaign. You can see our legislation we've written for a Postal Bank or give us a call to get involved in that. Uh, now onto our first topic. This is what economic breakdown looks like. It's not some future possibility. Uh, we are facing a real economic breakdown. It's the beginning, it's the early stages. We can still turn this around, but we're going in fast. And what I wanted to really drill down into in this segment this week uh, is what governments are doing, or should we say not doing, uh, to tackle the crisis, on particularly the financial front and on, the, of course, the economic front, even more importantly, but I wanted to first take a look at the question of inflation. Now, um, on the 16th of May, this was quite revealing, Richard, uh, the Bank of England Governor, Andrew Bailey, uh, testified in front of the British Treasury Select Committee and had some interesting things to say and he was being quizzed by, of course, politicians. In the first video I want to show here, it's just a very brief uh, clip, 
He's discussing inflation in various sectors and then he raises the food crisis and it's just interesting the terms in which he puts that. So we'll just roll that clip. I'm afraid the one that I, I'm going to sound, I guess, rather apocalyptic about is food. I have to tell you that, I mean, I think this is, very, this is a big concern. So, yeah, that's, that's a crisis point, a real crunch point, and, you know, he uses quite dramatic terms, and it is very real, and we'll come back to that. We'll talk about some of the parameters of the global food situation a bit later. But in this next brief clip, he talks about the fact that... Um, most of the inflation is coming from outside of the UK. So he admits that raising local interest rates ain't gonna make any difference, basically. Um, uh, and then, anyway, we'll roll the clip and then we'll discuss it. It struck me that reading the report and actually in your responses to our chair, that I think you said 80% of no. CPI is due to external factors and you know, to a certain degree, raising rates, you say, I think, would have had very limited impact. You, have you felt a bit helpless through this period? Well, yes. I mean, it is very, very, I mean, more than uncomfortable. I'm trying to think of a word that's even more severe than that. I mean, you know, you, it, it's a very, very difficult place to, for us to be. And I mean, to predict and to forecast 10% inflation and then say, as we were saying a few minutes ago, uh, and there's not a lot we can do about 80% of it, as I can tell you, it is an extremely difficult place to be. I mean, we have to recognise the reality of the situation that we face. And on Ukraine, to what extent are economic sanctions a part of the projections going forward? From well, I mean, all the, all the things that I've been, just been saying, of course, get picked up because we use market prices for commodities. So we use market prices for energy and for food uh, goods. I mean, just to give you an example, the, wheat price, the world wheat price has gone up uh, just under 25% since I think we were at the here, last here at the last hearing. Um, so we pick, we use those prices, and of course those prices will therefore, you know, include a view of what's what could evolve. But I have to tell you, based on what we've seen over the last year, and going back to our earlier discussion, there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of uncertainty around uh, around the situation. So I just want to raise a few points about this because, firstly, he's admitting raising interest rates won't work. But we have to do it. We have to do it anyway. It's that old line again, you know, when, when you only have a hammer, every problem has to be a nail. Exactly. They yeah. just don't have the tools. Well, they do have the tools if they desire to use them, but mm. they're working in this monetarist framework that locks them into, as you said, the hammer and the nail. Yeah, and our Reserve Bank isn't much different. I mean, it's been broadly acknowledged by all the authorities here that, yeah, that the causes of, of inflation, it's a global problem and, and raising rates here isn't going to do much either, if anything. Mm. And it'll make other situations worse, worse, which I know we'll get to. Yeah, in, exactly. In and of course, he and we'll talk about this more when we talk about the energy crisis in Australia, but he, he says in there, interestingly, that, oh, you know, we use market prices for commodities, therefore these prices are going up as if there were a choice not to use market forces, yeah. is that? <laughs> well, uh, and we do the same thing again, because, yeah. and, it's, and it's purely out of ideology. I mean, in Britain's case, they obviously don't have as many native natural resources as we do. Um, mm. They do have some, they have a lot of, you know, they, they still mine coal and uh, they have, you know, their energy market, you know, they have a lot of, um, they've privatised a lot of their energy generation, the same as we have. Yeah, yeah, they've had a lot of, the retailers shutting down over there, like we're beginning to see here. Um, now, he also admitted that he feels helpless to act against this crisis. And later on in, in the um, back and forth, uh, he was quizzed about additional crises that might come in on top of all of this. And he, he said, look, we'll, we'll simply run out of horsemen <laughs> to face this <laughs> apocalypse. Um, so it's quite stark, actually. And I just wanted to spend a little bit of time um, talking about the, the, this um, nail and hammer phenomenon, actually, because why we um, admit to these problems that we're locked into this framework that won't work anyway and don't overthrow it is just, it's the definition, another definition of insanity. So when you think about um, monetary policy, we want to contrast that to having a physical economic approach. So you can either fiddle with the monetary levers or you can actually intervene directly into the real economy. So on the monetarist front, which of course you have the central banks in control for starters, independent central banks, they can 
raise or lower interest rates. They can raise or lower the money supply and there's a number of ways they can do that such as like the RBA does open market operations, quantitative easing under extraordinary or all circumstances these days, uh, repurchase operations, those kind of things. So they're all about injecting or withdrawing, tightening or loosing money. So these are their levers. Um, now the outcomes of that process, of course, when you raise or lower interest rates, you will um, dampen or heighten consumer demand. You'll increase or decrease borrowing from banks, so more or less people will lend. And then that is supposed to filter through to the economy. Mm. So it's a more indirect fashion. Yeah, the old trickle down idea. And then the other thing though, this is where it's a very crude, these are crude levers, is that where does it trickle down to? Because as we've seen with the quantitative easing programs um, after the global financial crisis, as we've seen in the last couple of years with the various interventions uh, through the COVID period, etc., when these monetary measures are used, a lot of the money, 80 or 90 percent probably, flows through into speculative operations. Mm. I mean, here the classic, of course, we've seen is the housing bubble, where all the RBA can do in terms of its market operations and quantitative easing is boost a housing bubble which is already bloated to the point of bursting. So mm. that just makes matters worse. And of course, what money didn't go into that largely went into corporate profits. Um, and yeah. now we're being told that we can't have wage rises because that'll increase inflation. Yeah, um, exactly. Whereas wages haven't have barely moved and corporate profits have gone up, what is it, 18% while uh, mm. aggregate wages have gone up about 5 mm. And And that was what I was going to say next. You know, in terms of the monetarist levers and the outcome, this... Um, flow through has an impact on increasing or decreasing inflation depending on which way they're moving the levers. But I want to contrast it now to the physical economic way of looking at it because then you see how much more control you actually wield in what you actually want to achieve in terms of a growing economy and the livelihood of the citizens protecting and boosting that as opposed to, you know, um, some figures on a um, balance sheet. So. Governments, rather than central banks, of course, are in the box seat when it comes to a physical economic approach. Um, they can issue long-term, low-interest credit, and they can actually make the decisions that direct the credit into particular fields of the economy, particularly infrastructure, um, but also other areas such as agriculture, manufacturing, and so forth. They can also have policies to incentivise industry and agriculture from tariffs to bounties to you know countless other things we've used ourselves in this country over the years and they can use it all in combination with those monetarist measures such as interest rates and so forth it's all part of the mix yeah. and the government uh, as i think you wrote an article a few weeks ago in our alert service um, newsletter that the government retains that power today. They could use that any time they wanted. Absolutely. They just refuse to. They can direct the Reserve Bank to direct credit more or less into different areas so they can put less into housing and more into infrastructure, mm. etc. And they can spend money directly. They can just have the central bank create money to be spent on infrastructure projects or whatever else they choose. Mm. If they decide to do it, it's the question of the political will. and. Um, you know, so the outcomes, if you're thinking about this physical economic approach, the outcomes of that mean expanded economic output. Um, and because you're directing it into uh, the real economy rather than into all these speculative fields, you actually have um, the risk of inflation being highly offset by increased productivity. So, you know, people are working, they're getting paid, you've got... Um, you know, productive labour, a growing economy and the income coming in off of that, which is boosting the coffers of the government. I mean, this is why in times of ex great growth, in like even in, after the, world, the war, world War II and the war period, uh, we might have had the highest debt we ever had, but we paid it off very, very mm. fast because we were building the real economy. Yeah, the growth rate was faster than the accumulation of interest on the debt, and so it was all just paid down. In, you know, as you would normally expect from like a successful business, for instance. Exactly. Uh, so, you know, um, of course.
course, businesses can't print their own money, or they're not supposed to. <laughs> but um, but that's really you know otherwise the same sort of a thing. Mm. Like, a debt itself isn't the problem. No, that's right. You don't have to be excessively worried about debt per se, and especially as we've seen in a heavily indebted country like Japan, especially when you owe it to yourself because mm. you've created it through your national institutions. Yeah, and and public banks. Yeah, governments in control of banking makes all the difference to having a completely different framework so you're not locked into what poor old Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England, was saying. And coming back to, to him, to the Bank of England and the Fed, I want to use this as an example um, because in recent statements, the Fed has said that they will raise rates, interest rates, even though, quote, rising rates could negatively affect domestic economic activity. So, you know, here you are, we desperately need economic recovery, but they're saying, oh, well, we've got to raise rates, it's going to hurt economic activity, but we've got to do it anyway because they're locked in. And the Bank of England, similarly, in that um, statement from which we just played some clips, has also admitted that they'll raise rates even if it leads to recession, which would be really deadly for people given the crisis, cost of living crisis that people are facing over there, um, <clears throat> because we have to get inflation back to target. You know, we've got this nail, we have to bang it in. Mm. Even though they're admitting <clears> that, <throat> what did he say, 80% of the causes of the inflation are external, therefore they can't influence them anyway. Exactly. Don't, don't bring up, you know, side things like that. <laughs> now, I want to contrast it, though, to another approach, uh, and it's China, sorry, but <clears throat> that's reality. <laughs> what China uh, is looking at in this period, and, of course, they've had, you know, um, an economy heavily affected by lockdowns in Beijing and Shanghai um, with Omicron and so forth. But nevertheless, their approach has been far more successful than the Western countries. Um, and in a recent speech, um, the president, Xi Jinping, was stressing the idea of what he called healthy capital. Um, and uh, one of his um, ministers talked about and released a 33-point policy package to increase economic activity. Slightly different approach to the Western countries with new bond issues for railway construction, aviation. Uh, they'll do things like doubling the bank lending quotas for small, and medium and micro enterprises. And taking that approach, and, and there's all these new yeah, rail plans. I mean, they've already got 30,000 kilometres of high-speed rail. It's closer to 40 now, I yeah, think. Yeah, I mean, so. it's growing all the time. Um, but, yeah, they've got even more of that planned. Um, they want to make the high-speed rails faster so you can move things to where they need to be. Um, but China's inflation in, the, uh, well, in March, from the previous March, was 1.5%. And that's compared to US inflation at March for the previous year at, of 8.5%. So you can <laughs> see the stark difference. Also, China's GDP... Uh, in the second quarter was much less than what it normally would be because of the reasons I mentioned. But nonetheless, they had a growth in GDP of 1.8%. In the first quarter of this year, US GDP growth, well, it wasn't growth, it mm. shrunk by 1.5%. So, you know, that's just that's just what it is with these different mm. approaches. Um, now, what I want to get into now and drill down to in a little bit more is... You know, with the, the approach that Bank of England, Fed, Reserve Bank are taking, I want to look at the consequences of that because we've been doing this experiment for 30, 40 years, neoliberalism and so forth and, you know, looting everything, breaking everything down, deregulating it, put, throwing it to the free market, which is supposed you know, to be more... Privatisation of natu state natural monopolies like electricity and so on. Yeah, yeah, well, we'll show a very mm. clear example of the impact that's had in a moment. Um, so we're going to talk about the breakdown of the literally the economic capacity to produce and deliver what we require to live. That's the standpoint I want you to think about economics as. Um, and, of course, this will raise all of the cost of living issues, but I want you to think about what we're going to go through from the standpoint of that physical economic capacity to deliver on a day-to-day -day basis the goods and services that we all need and that we take for granted, uh, mind you, to survive. So the first example we'll go through is energy production and supply. Um, 
Now, I'll just mention, because it's one thing if you're in Europe right now and you've got the impact of um, declining uh, energy flows coming out of Russia and so forth, and in the UK they're actually warning of power likely to be rationed for six million homes in the coming period. Um, and just lucky they're not coming into their winter like we are. <laughs> but here in Australia we've seen, uh, of course, you know, everyone will have seen in the news, wholesale prices of gas are five times the usual rate. Retail prices are expected to double potentially. Um, the Australian energy market operator yesterday warned of gas supply shortages and triggered the supply guarantee mechanism, which means that emerge emergency supplies were released for the first time since 2017, or the first time ever since this system was in place. Um, and a threat to system security notice was issued on Wednesday morning for Victoria. Uh, Treasurer Jim Chalmers warned of a perfect storm of energy price spikes. Now, you know, while there's things like coal plants temporarily going on offline and so forth, there really should not be any cause mm. for a gas crisis. I mean, you've written extensively yeah. about our enormous yeah, supplies. Oceans of gas, almost literally, I mean, the offshore fields, and a lot of it's in WA. And if you want to talk about how to solve these problems, well, gas is still going for, what is it, um, five, seven dollars a gigajoule in, in WA. Now, they're separated from the East Coast market that they call the national market. Mm. Um, but WA's always had a domestic gas reservation mechanism where I think it's something like 15% of the gas produced has to be made available for, you know, first the, the domestic market gets first dibs. That's businesses and households. Um, and they're saying, oh, we can't do that um, in the, on the East Coast. The, the CEO of Santos, one of the big, uh, you know, mainstays of the gas cartel, there's four or five companies, <coughs> depending how you count them, a couple of joint ventures. but. Um, they know oh, there is no more gas, you know, there, we can't just snap our fingers and make gas appear. Well, they're, they're exporting double the amount of gas that they were a year ago. Um, and, and that sells for how much? And um, I'm not sure of the current price, but um, I read yesterday that, the, that uh, customers in China are buying our gas 25% cheaper than we are. Mm. Um, a number of analysts have pointed out that the extraction price on it is about a dollar a gigajoule out of the ground. They're selling it. At, it's now being capped at 40 because otherwise they were worried about it heading up to maybe 80 um, wholesale price dollars per gigajoule. Um, the whole thing's insane. And why do we have retailers? So, because <laughs> of course we, what we've done in Victoria and in other states is privatised all of our. Um, well, elect, in the case of electricity, mm. um, we privatise the companies and then as well the lines and the distribution has all been, you know, yeah. broken up and sold to different companies. And then you have retailers that sell us our electricity and our, our gas. Mm. And now you have retailers that are saying, we can't provide you the gas. Yeah, yeah. This guy, in, um, I think he's in New South Wales, a company called Reamped. It's an electricity retailer. And it was making its money by using very efficient modern computer systems to snap up the cheapest wholesale deals and then retail that at competitive prices. But now there's none of that to be had. And so their CEO got up on, on uh, TV and on Facebook and so on the other day and said, look, just go elsewhere if you can because um, you're going to pay double and we'll still go broke supplying you. Mm. Uh, you know, almost in so many words. Uh, I think last week... Uh, one of the, it was like the seventh biggest gas retailer just shut its doors. Mm. Just, no, nah, we're done. Mm. Gone to the wall. And uh, so everybody who had contracts with them suddenly has to buy off the spot market mm. um, unless they can find a contract somewhere else. So, you know, just think about our capability as a nation to supply energy, which is mm. crucial for everything. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's talks on the, in the media that today about um, thousands of manufacturing jobs will be at risk if this yeah, situation is yeah, not restored. Yeah, because they use gas both as a feedstock and a power supply, a heat supply or energy. Um, and so you've got, you know, one of the biggest plastic, I think it's the biggest plastic producer in the country, a company called Kenos, is talking about scaling back production and potentially shutting it down, you know, indefinitely. Mm. 
uh, one of the few remaining textile companies left uh, in Melbourne here. Um, I forget the name of it offhand, but um, they're talking about closing their doors. That's 540 odd jobs, direct and indirect. Yeah. They have 40 employees and another 500 or so indirect jobs depend on their operations. Um, but on the electricity, why we have all of this, well, we put out, and I printed it off here, from, you can find it on our archive website, um, from five years ago almost, um, the 5th of July 2017, we put out a press release pointing out why this was all happening and warning that it was going to get worse like mm. it is now. And it's entirely artificial because, as I said earlier, um, Elisa, these are, were vertically integrated state-owned natural monopolies. Natural monopoly meaning that you know, it's something there is only one of mm. and it requires government intervention to even make it happen. You know, it's got to requisition the zones for the power lines or the gas mains and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And these all used to be state-owned until the, you know, uh, early 1990s, Jeff Kennett in the case of Victoria. Uh, so they introduced this, comp this national competition policy at the federal level. Um, they privatised all of these things, but not only that, they broke them up mm -hmm. and forced them to operate, as, forced the, the, in the case of electricity, the poles and wires, the distribution networks are one company, the retailers are another company, the, uh, the actual generators are another company again. Now, in some of the cases, the big, what they call gen tailors own generation and retail, but not distribution. Um, but... Okay, what do you create with, when you create competition in a monopoly market? You're just adding on extra layers of cost for advertising, for extra staff, for all of these things that don't need to happen because it's a, it's, it's a captive market. Mm. And for all the neoliberal, the neo excuse me, spoonerism, uh, for all the neoliberal axioms that the private sector is, almost, is always more efficient, well, as we pointed out in 2017, no, I'll just read this passage out here. The Competition Principles Agreement signed on the 11th of April 1995 by the federal, state and territory governments, this is from the, this is from the National Competition Council's website, says that, quote, government businesses should not enjoy any net competitive advantage simply as a result of their public sector ownership, which is an admission that, yes, it is more efficient. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it goes on to explain, quote, for significant government businesses, governments undertook to adopt a corporatization model where, where appropriate and to impose on the business full taxes or tax equivalents and debt guarantee fees to offset advantages from government guarantees and to apply to the business re to apply to the business regulations normally applying to private sector businesses. End quote. In other words, national competition policy forbids state-owned enterprises from performing the public services they were designed for and forces them to operate as for-profit corporations so that the private companies can compete. And of course, in the case of electricity, this is the effect is tripled by the fact that, as I just said, they broke up the, the three different aspects of the electricity system mm. into, into, separate, uh, into separate companies mm. with, with separate competitors. Yeah, no. So the, the, the free market, look where it got us. Yeah, and so <laughs> um, electricity prices in particular should be, you know, at most one third of what mm, they are mm -hmm. now, at most. Yeah. Now, we could talk about this more and, you know, how we should nas nationalise everything. And we've talked about it. We've put out, you can look at our website, there's more there. But I want to run through a bunch more things quite quickly in terms of uh, our economic capacity and how it's just dying uh, a, a rapid death. So food production, as um, was referenced by the Bank of England governor before, apart from the situation with Russia, Ukraine and grain not getting out and there's things that could be talked about there but we don't have time to today. But apart from that, India has suspended wheat exports indefinitely. They lost over 15% of their wheat in a heat wave. There's actually a growing list of countries that for one reason or another have restricted exports. Um, you've got, some of it is just really insane where, for instance, um, in uh, Sri Lanka, in 2021, chemical fertilisers and pesticides were banned. 
Uh, rice yields fell 30 to 50 percent nationwide as a result of that and many farmers didn't even bother to plant crops and you've got other equally um, ludicrous uh, green rules such as in Europe where rules were set aside um, sorry, rules to set aside land for reasons of biodiversity have hampered uh, production of food as well. And in terms of the inputs, because of course we've had soaring prices of fertilisers and fuel impacting food production, I just want to show this quick clip um, which talks, there's a US farmer talking about what this has done to their cost of production. And the war in Ukraine is only the latest of many problems to hit the world food supply. Food prices were already high from soaring inflation and fuel costs. Fertilizer prices are now 40% higher than a month ago before the invasion of Ukraine, which along with high fuel prices makes it too expensive for some farmers to plant crops this year. We've never seen these type of increases in fertilizer. You're talking three, 400% increases in a 14 month period. Add to that a drought that damaged this spring's US winter wheat harvest. And then in addition to that, of course, you know, you've got the soaring prices, as we've talked about with energy, you've got resources, you've got the inability to secure the resources that you need and inputs such as, for example, microchips, you've got difficulty for people to get cars, um, utes, you know, farm equipment and other equipment. Um, strategic minerals abilities to get those sorts of things uh, that are hampered at the moment. Um, so it's not just necessarily the, the production of those things, but getting it from one place to another. So there's a lot mm. of logistics. Well, the international supply chain bottlenecks that we've been talking about for you know, mm. a couple of years now with the pandemic and so on. Yeah, and we're seeing that, um, you know, for instance, there was, there's been reports in the media this week with the freezing cold weather about over a thousand people homeless in Lismore after the floods and you know you've got a lot of people that are living just in the shell of their house with no internal walls you've got other people that have been put up in caravan parks and so forth but for people who do want to build you know they can't get a hold mm. of basic building materials, materials they can't no. get tradies that they can come to do specialized things um, you know even the public toilets in town can't be used yeah they're still out of commission as of a couple of weeks ago at least um, but speaking of construction too, and again, we'll just mention it quickly, but um, there's warnings of high numbers of construction company collapses. A lot of these guys have fixed price contracts and can't pass on the cost increases. And some of these are ma and pa operations, not just the big, big players. Mm. But uh, on speaking of the big players, though, one of the biggest, Metricom, um, is in talks with both the Victorian and New South Wales governments for bailouts and, may, and potentially the governments are going to take over the uh, started but it not completed uh, projects. And they're saying, no, it's all fine, we've got the cash flow, but the New South Wales business regulator is already talking about bringing in the receivers. Mm. So, um, And then talking about local infrastructure, places like Lismore and so forth, uh, we mentioned last week this local government authority report where they've notif identified $51 billion worth of poor quality infrastructure, another $100 billion uh, that's in fair condition but that needs to be upgraded ASAP. Um, things like water, um, you know, I was only recently made aware of a situation here in our local area where we've got quite a large amount of construction going on in local facilities, um, building of a new um, tower for living here just across the road from us. This has caused a situation where the water pressure is insufficient and the hydrants in the local area, if there's a fire, don't have enough pressure and they had to install a new pump just, you know, down here, down the road here. Um, you know, think about, you know, we all during the pandemic were worried about not being able to get toilet paper. I mean, what <laughs> would, how would we feel if suddenly you can't flush, can't your, flush toilet your toilet or something? I mean, you know. These are real things that we, as I said earlier, take for granted. Um, hospitals and healthcare we talked about last week, so I won't get into that, but it's that bad and we've had the crisis point really reaching a crunch in Victoria. I even heard someone on the radio one morning this week from I think it was one of the medical associations, the local one, saying, look, just don't get sick because mm. um, the chances of you getting picked up by an ambulance or getting treated even in a corridor is very slim. Medicines is another real mm. crisis point and again it's in the news where we can't get a hold of iodine contrast dyes for instance they're being 
um, they're having to ration various diagnostics and it's not just for diagnostics you know ahead of treatment that these kind of um, dyes are used in heart procedures to put stents in people that have had heart attacks of course there was a closure of the factory in Shanghai um, uh, we get a lot of this from GE Healthcare which yeah, is an American company but manufacturers in China and that's about 80 percent of our supplies dependent on one factory whose stupid idea was that mm, exactly um, now also IV drip fluids, which is saline fluid, but it's got to be produced in a very, you know, hygienic way and so forth. And the bags for IV fluids, there's been shortages. In the US, there's shortfalls of 100 prescription drugs at the moment. I'll just roll this quick clip actually showing the kinds of shortages of various kinds of equipment down to bandages in uh, the US hospital system. <laughs> On top of a capacity crunch from COVID cases, our inpatient unit is totally full. Major hospital in Shelbyville now has a new pandemic problem. Here's our normal storeroom for this area. A shortage of basic medical supplies, bins in their storage room suddenly going bare. These plastic pieces are pieces that, that we're seeing just at random. Be, be unavailable. Bedside basins, insulin needles, surgical tape and tubes all affected by supply chain issues. We've totally ran out of some, some of those at different times. Vendors are out of stock. Scheduled deliveries don't show. There are unpredictable outages despite the hospital ordering materials long term. I've been a nurse for 40 years and I've been in healthcare all that time. Never thought that we'd have a day that we'd have to worry about whether or not we had a roll of tape to be able to secure an IV or that we would have a, a difficult getting a, a bandage to put on a surgery patient, but we are. Three weeks ago, for example, crutches were the issue. Normal group purchasing sources were all depleted. The staff had to make retail pharmacy runs on their way to work. So we were going out to the retail, hitting up CVS's, hitting up Walgreens, hitting up local DME stores trying to find enough crutches to be able to meet the needs in our system. Ordering from Amazon is also part of the gig here now, and it's costly to fill the gaps. A 10% increase in supply prices at major hospital. And I want to just follow through with this with, um, you know, probably the most extreme case at the moment, which is Sri Lanka, which is in a grave debt crisis. They can't import what they usually would import for lack of funds and the IMF is stringing them over a barrel to get them to implement all this austerity and structural reform before they give them any loans. At least China and Russia have given them some money directly. But just watch this video. I mean, the headline in The Guardian said, people are going to die. Crisis hit Sri Lanka, runs out of medicine. Waiting for drugs. Hope fades in this state-run cancer hospital on the outskirts of Sri Lanka's capital, Colombo. Before we at least had some hope because we had the medication, but now we're really scared. We're really helpless. We don't have money to take our child abroad for treatment either. Our lives are at risk. We are always living in fear. We don't know whether we'll have medicines or not. Without medicines, doctors are being forced to postpone life-saving medical tests and surgeries. They warn the drug shortage could become its own death sentence. As a government hospital, we depend on the government supplies. It's uh, very bad for the cancer patient because the cancer will grow and has a bad effects on the patient outcome. You know, if you are in a queue for fuel, ultimately the people will lose the fuel. If they are in the queue for the gas, ultimately they lose the gas. But if patients are on queue for the drugs, they will lose their life. So, you know, this is basically where we're heading if mm. we don't get our act together, um, start to do the kind of um, nation building that we know how to do. Yeah, and manufacturing, as we've said before, as, as I said earlier, we have everything we need in this country, every resource, all the technology to do almost literally anything we decide to do, the, that, but that's the thing, you have to decide to do it, and that's a political, that's a political decision that has to be made. Mm, that's right. Now, we could say more, we could talk about this all day, and we basically do <laughs> in all of our organising, not just on this show, um, but we want to move on to our next topic, which is the real outcomes of Pacific power plays. 
Um, now, you wrote this up for the Australian Alert Service this week and, of course, people should call in for a copy if they haven't before or you can subscribe to get it every week. But um, following the um, tour of Pacific Islands by Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, the media, of course, have gloated that um, they failed to achieve their multilateral agreement that they were hoping to um, get agreement on called the Common Development Vision. Um, now, the president of Micronesia had a bit to say about this, David Panuelo, and he um, basically advocated that his fellow Pacific nations reject the treaty due to fears that a new Cold War between China mm. and the West could break out. So you, you really see how these nations have been put in the middle yeah. of this bigger dynamic that they're not very happy about. Um, but he cited the draft communique of this um, treaty arrangement that China was pushing uh, in his, he wrote a letter to other Pacific leaders and he basically said, look, China's proposal is attractive to many of us, but with, quote, the right information, information, it does seem like China might be seeking control and ownership of our communications infrastructure. And he cited biodata collection and mass surveillance. But you read the draft yeah. communique. Was that in yeah, there? Yeah, the, um, he sent this letter on the 20th of May, um, including to Scott Morrison. And nobody knows who leaked it, but I would point out that the Reuters correspondent who broke the story is based in Sydney. Um, <laughs> No, so uh, all of these uh, the, these media didn't didn't uh, accept the ABC to its credit. Act, uh, none of the others actually linked to the uh, or supplied the original documents. Um, for starters, these are obviously not something China was expecting to have adopted at this conference at this meeting because it's the, these are draft documents that are very unpolished compared to their usual very professional standard. I mean, especially in international agreements, they it's, weren't at the point of being released. Yeah, they, in other words, yeah, these these are not anything that's that's going to be signed off on. Those are all written in precise legal language in what in whatever language they're written in. This is not the case with and these. And they would documents. have been waiting for input from yeah, yeah, the yeah. Pacific and nations to make those draft treaties. Yeah, Exactly. Final. So this is a proposal that China's brought. This is like, here's where we're at now based on the, the talks that they've had so far. And now the Pacific countries are going to go away and discuss them amongst themselves. And it may or may not um, be adopted. Um, it might, you know, change in form substantially. Who knows? But this is, you know, this is the normal diplomatic process. So the idea that China was trying to force this thing down their throats um, and they all said no and rejected it and we're siding with the, um, you know, with Canberra and Washington against China is just, it's, it's farcical. Mm. They're all signing individual agreements with China on various aspects of development. Yeah, and we'll go through those. But one of the things, you know, where um, we said uh, Panuelo talked about with the right information, this looks like it could be dodgy. I mean, one clue to what that information is that he's getting is that he referred to the fact that China explicitly seeks to undermine the international rules-based order by mm. developing a new form of international relations featuring, God forbid, mutual respect, equity, justice and win-win cooperation. Yeah, <laughs> and under the framework of international law and the UN Charter. Yeah, exactly. Heaven, heavens for fan. Um, so, you know, where's he getting that from? Yeah. So obviously he's being hammered, as many of these countries are at the moment, um, which is the real Pacific power play because we've yeah. just had um, President Biden in the region for a number of different meetings, including a meeting of the Quad. They've, you know, resisted it to their um, credit. But um, Biden was, they established this Indo-Pacific Partnership for Maritime Domain Awareness. This sounds more like the biodata collection yeah, and mass yeah. surveillance mass that surveillance. was being referenced. Maybe he was reading the wrong treaty. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that this would include satellite monitoring systems covering the Pacific Islands, Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean. And Secretary of State Blinken literally put it this way. He said, look, we can't, we can't change China. I mean, they'd like to. <laughs> we they can't, tried that. We can't that. change China. But we will shape the strategic environment around Beijing to advance our vision. Mm. In other words, we'll surround China and, you know, block them in. Um, so they're doing exactly what they accuse yeah. China of doing, which yeah. is not. And, you know, you feel sorry for this um Micronesia and these other countries. I mean, Micronesia particularly is dependent for its reg for its government spending. Its budget is, is almost 30% yeah. US aid money so um, as of two years ago. Mm. Um, and it's reliant on 
the United States entirely for its defence and security under these um, articles of free association that they entered into in the 80s after 40 years of being ruled as a protector by the US Navy. Hmm. So, you know, um, and of course, uh, that, that's, that's the Marshall Islands as well, where they did the nuclear testing um, and, uh, and uh, Palau. That applies to so yeah I mean so these countries are, are over a barrel and I thought that the comments of um, the Timor-Leste president Jose Ramos Horta were quite incisive and he was he was particularly talking about the Solomon Islands and why they sought Chinese help when he talked about this he said well maybe they sought help because uh, uh, because the Solomon Islands closest neighbor in this case Australia has not responded to their need Maybe their neighbour wasted time lecturing them on human rights instead of trying to help. <laughs> um, and he went on to talk about um, their own situation in his country. Of course, he was the president um, a while ago and he's just come back in. But he said, for years we hoped Australia would, quote, invest serious money in support of infrastructure in Timor-Leste. Um, but of course, we didn't. And no, in fact, we ripped them off for that entire period and it's only just got settled um, just recently and now we're not helping them develop the gas fields that we tried to steal off them. Yeah, so. and that didn't even help us with our gas situation, but still. <laughs> um, it only and helped he, the gas companies. <laughs> um, and he went on to uh, say, you know, f for their part, it would be a mistake not to have a relationship of, um, with China, but he said he, he made this hilarious comment. He said, actually, I have to say, we in Timor-Leste are worried about how China is so much present in Australian life. Even our neighbours in the Northern Territory, they leased their Darwin port for a hundred years to China. Can you imagine if we were to lease the Dili port to the Chinese just for five years? The Australians and Americans would go berserk. <laughs> <laughs> yep, uh, they certainly would. I mean, it's, the, you know, one rule for thee and another for me. Yeah. But um, as we mentioned, a number of these, if not all these countries that were visited um, by Wang Yi's tour um, did sign agreements. So this trip was not a failure in any sense. There's a lot of motion there. So they all, all 10 Pacific Islands he visited deepened their bilateral ties with China. There were bilateral agreements signed, memorandums of understanding for economic development signed, cooperation deals. Belt and Road agreements were signed and other agreements were prepared for future signing uh, involving these countries, Samoa, Fiji, Tonga, Kiribati, Micronesia, Niue, Cook Islands, PNG, Vanuatu and Timor-Leste. So there was actually a lot of progress that did happen but of course the Australian media in light of our Solomon's Red Line and all the other beating of the drum, war drums we've been doing, wanted to jump on this and say, you know, we, we crushed it, you know, the mm. Pacific wants us and not China, making it into this um, either or game rather than a win-win cooperation that would actually benefit the countries yeah. in the Pacific. And, you know, benefit us as well. Through We would have to develop here in order to help them develop. I mean, you know, Ramos Horta said it, you know, we didn't help them. Look look at what we've been talking about today. We can barely help ourselves. Yeah. And we've done it to ourselves. You know, we could be upscaling our food production, gas production, medical, manufacturing, all the mm. things that we went through. If we were intent upon helping our neighbours or Africa, for instance, um, you know, there's, there's so much of the world that desperately needs assistance to uplift themselves, which is China's approach, not just give them aid, mm. but give them the capabilities. Yeah, teach a man to fish and mm. all of that. Exactly. So that's what we've got to get onto. And the People's Bank, don't forget to check out those articles I mentioned at the beginning and begin to work in your local area um, for, I should say, the Postal Bank, but the Postal Bank can become the basis for a development bank to have the national funding required to invest in these areas because that there's no limits on that and it's not a problem whatsoever. We've done it before in our history. So contact us to find out more. That's pretty much it for today's show. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Elisa. Thanks for tuning in and join us next week. Authorised by Robert Bowick, Citizens Party, Melbourne.